Hello friends, how are you? I'm Ari Thurger and today I'm going to answer a couple of questions I have received on my Instagram. And today I have a special guest. <laughs> I'm babysitting this little fellow uh, this week. I am bird sitting. Anyway, once in a while I shall ask for questions on specific subjects on my Instagram, so be attentive. Uh, this time I have picked three questions and I'll try to answer them without having to delve too much on the subject. Uh, just some quick notes. The subject was animism and spirituality, so I have picked three questions concerning that. So here we go to the top three, and later on I may do a top five. First question. Do you think that those that are born with Nordic roots will naturally gravitate towards the culture? Well, uh, that seems to be the case indeed when people find out about a certain ethnical branch in their ancestry and that will naturally cause some curiosity towards that cultural past and people feel inclined to explore even more and try to follow that cultural past. But that may be a problem because people are limiting their knowledge solely on that cultural field. I know a lot of people who have Nordic roots and they are not at all inclined to that cultural past. And I equally know hundreds of people who clearly don't have any Nordic roots but felt a connection um, with that cultural past, spiritually speaking. And they are very much inclined to that cultural past. I have a friend who is absolutely totally Chinese and he clearly has no Nordic roots but he is one of the best people I know when it comes to Nordic symbology, magic, spirituality in general. To him, Nordic paganism is more real than it is for many who have Nordic roots but do nothing at all towards that. I think when people know they have certain roots on a specific culture they think they are entitled and love to give themselves a label and that's it. There are many who call themselves heathens and follow the old pre-Christian Scandinavian or, Scandinavian or Germanic ways in general but they actually don't. I think that's the actual problem. S some people think that just because they have roots on a particular ethnical group or culture they feel special and it's in their blood and the ancestors guide them directly. Many people think that spirituality is about race and the more you physically look like to a particular physical image of a specific ethnical group the more true you are. That's a sad illusion. There are many Auzothru and other hidden groups who reject people based on their race. Rejection based on race is a very sad reality among many neo-pagan groups and organizations. There is this idea that the particular religion or spirituality can only be practiced by those who have that ancestral past in their blood. Spirituality isn't about race, isn't about uh, physical appearance. People give too much importance to someone's physical appearance. And that's not being pagan. Paganism has its roots on animism and in the belief that everything possesses a soul or conscious. If you believe that a specific spiritual entity can inhabit any kind of, of physical body, then it doesn't matter the physical appearance. The oldest mythological accounts tells us of the gods coming in many forms, in many bodies. So who's to say that the person right in front of you isn't a deity inhabiting that body, having that physical appearance? The gods people profess to love and worship can very well be right next to them in the physical appearance of a specific human race people think has, they have not the right to follow their religion. I think this would give a useful and insightful video actually. I may do just that in the future. Spirituality is not about race. In fact, the cult of the ancestors itself isn't about biology or blood ties. We clearly have 
in various sources, including uh, Scandinavian ones, that the cult of the ancestors doesn't necessarily has to be towards family members. A person could adopt someone else's child, giving one's name to a child and short the continuation of that person's existence through the child. So many people would even adopt the children of their enemies to vanquish the line of the enemy and start a new one. The cult of the ancestors was also towards the tribe, the community, the families that have no blood ties with each other. The cult of the ancestors was not about blood ties, but about the connections people create with one another. It was about feelings and emotions and the positive influence people had over others. The cult of the ancestors isn't solely about family members, it's about the pack, the people you choose to be your family. Those kind of connections. If you had, for instance, a family member who was abusive and oppressive and had a clear negative impact on your life, you are not obligated to worship that ancestor just because he or she belonged to the family and have consanguinity ties. The worship of the ancestors is the worship of those with whom you have created strong ties, constructive and loving ties, because only those who truly love you and care for you are the only ones that will be inclined to help you. So following something solely based on race, blood ties, ancestry, cultural roots, creates huge limitations. We should follow what calls to us, or rather pursuit what calls to us, not, not, not what is, is forced upon us. Spirituality is about freedom of mind. We don't need to specifically choose one single path and follow it for the rest of our lives, when there are thousands of paths we can walk through. I'm afraid I have extended this answer too much. Next question. You think the Nordic gods were real or just imagination? Both, actually. Again, if we think about animism, the gods were spiritual entities without form or shape, and they would manifest themselves through nature, through the forces of nature, or by inhabiting some form of life. Many deities were nothing more than manifestations of nature and the cycles of the natural world and cosmic forces. In time, we gave them names, we gave them shapes and appearance, the anthropomorphization of the divine. In the sources, the physical appearance of the gods is described, but their physical appearance is based on the physical appearance of that specific culture that worships them. To the Christians, God made humankind in his own image, but the pagans made the gods in their own image. The gods had no form, no physical aspect, until we gave it to them. And that's when we started to create limitations. Actually, uh, the problem isn't solely that. The problem is that many people take the myths too literally. The representation of Jesus, for instance, in various cultures changes his physical appearance according to the culture that worships him. There are many representations of Jesus being a blonde with green eyes, or with a pale Asian look, or with a Mongolian thick black hair and darker skin, or with a much emphasized native African look, etc. And say what you will about Islamic religion, but they have a very useful idea that actually gives uh, some, some spiritual freedom, not having the physical representation of their God, of Allah, uh, to let people in prayer create their own image of the divine and not limiting people to a specific image. Many people think the gods have that specific image and that forces them to have only that perception of the divine and are incapable of understanding the divinity in all things because they are restricted to a single mind image. Some will think that Odin is an old man with a long white beard sitting on some throne, 
or Thor, a muscular uh, redhead with a hammer in hand, or Freyr, fair of hair and skin and shining and all sexy, and the goddess Hel being half rotten and half flesh. Imagining this and such other fantasies greatly diminishes our understanding of the divine. The images of the divine is one of the worst traps that destroys faith, because faith or spirituality will be limited by one's imagination, and that imagination is restricted to the images given to you. Enlightenment is to understand that divinity has no bodily categories. Physical shape can never be applied to, to divinity, because the divine is a wondrous variety of forces without physical or mental limitations. The divine is free from such limitations, as should we in our perceptions of the world. Remember this, because it's very important that you remember this and, and under, understand this. We do not see the world as it is, we see the world as we think it is. Reality is nothing more than our own perception towards what surrounds us, and our perception is limited by the physical and by religious illusions that create narrow ideas. Just because we don't see it, doesn't mean it isn't there. But more of that on another time. The gods are not just spiritual entities, forces of nature, metaphors, cosmic bodies, etc. Some gods were also people. That's part of the cult of the ancestors. To worship people of great renown, who performed great deeds and went beyond the nor normality of things, Many gods were actual people that started to be worshipped due to their personality and their traits and skills and so on. Many heroes, sorcerers, shamans, healers, um, kings, emperors and so on. These are the gods, both real and imagination. Like I said before on other videos, divinity is in all things and within ourselves. The natural world is divine. The natural world is a living spiritual entity, and we came from it, therefore the divine spark is in all of us as well. The gods are as real as we are and our capacity to explore the depths of our consciousness. We understand the divine when we let go of religious limitations forced upon us. Like I said in the previous answer, spirituality is not about race. Uh, the Divine cares little about race, politics, religion, culture in general, nothing of the sort. We are the ones that put limitations on spirituality when we try to force our own ideas and views upon others, and when for whichever political propaganda we try to shape in our own image the Divine itself. So you believe animals have souls, and if you eat them, you eat their souls. Well, yes, I do believe animals have a spiritual essence, or rather, an everlasting consciousness, just like we do. Again, animism. All things possess a soul or a spiritual entity. And all life belongs to a network composed by spiritual entities that have real influences upon every living entity. And it's curious that in many ancient cultures, there was the belief that the marrow contained the essence of the person or animal. And so in cannibal rituals, the marrow was consumed to obtain the essence of the deceased. Not only to acquire the attributes of the person, but also to ensure that that person lives on through the one that has consumed the essence of the deceased. Now, this has nothing to do with eating eyes and the heart of an enemy to acquire the skills of the vanquished enemy or to prevent the spirit of the enemy from returning for vengeance. Eating the marrow, be that of a human or animal, was to make sure the spiritual entity of that creature would live on inside the person that would consume it, consume the essence. And of course, uh, to acquire the special abilities of that animal or person. The perception of the soul was this, to literally consume the spiritual essence. 
I remember very, very well on a dig site. Uh, unfortunately, I came too late to participate in it. But there was a Paleolithic dig site uh, where it was found this cannibal ritual of consuming the marrow of family members, of people who had been carefully deposited on their graves. And you clearly see, you clearly have that perception uh, that there was a preoccupation to create space for the deceased and to bury the person with care, affection and love. Yet there was cannibalism in the process, precisely to consume the essence of the person so that the ancestor would live on through its descendants. This is probably the reason behind the myth of Thor and his goats. He kills one goat to consume it and share it with Loki, Tialfa and Roskva and their parents. But he specifically says that they should not eat the marrow. Tialfa or Tialfi broke one of the bones to suck out the marrow. And when Thor uh, resurrected the goat, the animal came out with a lame leg. And I think the original reason for the prohibition of eating the marrow from the goat's bones is that by eating its essence, Thor could not resurrect it again, because the soul of the animal had been vanquished or consumed and could not again inhabit its body. This was a Paleolithic belief uh, that was carried until very late, especially during the Neolithic still. Again, if we understand animism, we understand that everything possesses a spiritual essence and an everlasting consciousness and there is a very real interaction between spiritual entities. We consume and will eventually be consumed. A never-ending uh, spir spiral of sp spiritual interactions. And another example I would like to give you just to finalize this video and under this idea of animals having souls uh, the understanding we have of sacrificial animals in burials, in cremation contexts, is that in the cremation process, the bodies are physically transformed. And combining the bodies of sacrificed animals with the body of the deceased person creates a new spiritual entity and the individual embodies the power of the animal. As I've explained before concerning the Norse shamanic perspective of the spirit, the matter and the spirit are not a separated, a separated reality. And in order to release the spiritual form, the matter must be destroyed. To release the essence, the power, the force, the main or megin. So in cremation, there is a process of destruction of both the bodies of the sacrificed animals and the deceased to result in a fusion of spiritual essences. Cremation is interpreted as transformation and the most common type of animal sacrifice was cremation. The spiritual essence of the person will be transformed and acquire the animal spiritual essence. But then we also have animal sacrifices in burial contexts, unburnt remains, so in here there is no transformation, there is something else. Cremation is probably to infuse the deceased with animal characteristics. And so, on that line of thought, unburnt animal sacrifices in burials could mean transportation if we, think, uh, if we keep in mind the shamanic view. We know that shamans evoke animal spirits through a variety of ways and methods, including sacrificing the animals. In burial context, this could mean the animals are the steeds used by the deceased to get the person in the right place to communicate with the right deity or deities, or simply to make the spiritual journey. This may be one of the reasons why horses were the most common animals to be sacrificed. Animals have souls or a spiritual essence or consciousness that lives on. The idea that animals don't have souls starts with Christianization, for two main reasons. The first reason was because, in the beginning, Christianity within the Roman Empire, in Rome itself, was a, re a religion of peace. <laughs> and 
prohibited killing and bloodshed. Yet, there was a problem. Animal sacrifice was still part of the rituals. Christianity, as its basis on Judaism and other uh, monotheistic religious perceptions of the um, nomadic peoples of the Middle East, mostly of the Arabian Peninsula. The lamb was a common animal sacrificed to the spirit of God, to the storm God that came into his own temple in the form of either a bull, a goat or a lamb. And this deity would become the Judeo-Christian God we know of from the biblical scriptures. Animal sacrifice was violent and there was bloodshed, something directly against the belief system of early Roman Christians. The idea that animals didn't have a soul had to be created, to give the idea that they would not suffer. And the killing was pure and clean and needed because they had no soul, therefore they would not suffer and their sole purpose was to serve man. Animals without soul gave a sort of peace of mind to early Roman Christians so that they could continue to do animal sacrifice without being a subject too heavy on their consciousness by performing a killing. And the second reason was a political reason. When Christianity came in contact with European paganisms outside Rome. To be more precise, when the church came in contact with peoples whose cultures were still very animistic in nature. Animism is the basis of paganism. And by denying animism and destroying animistic belief systems, paganism is easily forgotten. Paganism is the tree and animism is its roots. Striking, striking directly upon the basic animistic perceptions destroys paganism. Animals have no soul, so goodbye to the animistic perceptions that everything possesses a soul. If nothing has a soul, then the pagan gods are not real because they are not alive since the divine manifestation came through the forces of nature and the representative animals of each deity. This is one of the main reasons why we still live in a Christian era, even though paganisms are on the rise everywhere. Neo-paganism is not yet paganism as long as it denies animistic ideas and perceptions of the world. Paganism is nothing without animism. Without animism, neo-paganism in great part seem like a paganization of Near Eastern monotheisms. Basically more of the same. So put more animism in your lives and you will surely better understand the essence of paganism. Alright my dear friends, I hope you have enjoyed this video. Be attentive to my Instagram because once in a while I shall ask, I shall ask you for questions on specific subjects. Uh, thank you so much for watching, see you on the next video and as always, Takurdo!